thanks everybody who's attending on zoom today. Um, really appreciate you guys getting on. Uh, we do live stream this to Facebook as well for this event. Um, but in the future, it, this is, this is going to be a members only event. So, um, if, if you're watching out there and you're not a member, please consider that. I'm going to go ahead. Um, now that I've seen a few people who have filtered in, I'm going to go ahead and start the Facebook live stream and then we'll get started. Thank you everybody who is attending either on zoom or on Facebook, however you're consuming us. Um, we, we just appreciate that you're listening. So today's webinar is called caring for your residents and yourself. It's kind of a two-in-one webinar um, from the Care You Give, Care You Get series, which um, if, you, if you guys haven't checked that out, that's a blog that's on our website. You can get to it. You can read all of them. We have them coming out at least once a month. And they kind of uh, focus on the, the care that you all give as CNAs and the, and the care that you need to get as CNAs and people. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Um, which we have two of them on right now, and then we're going to have a third one joining us, uh, joining us later on in the webinar. Um, but we have Lori Porter, who is the NACA CEO and co-founder, and Lisa Sweet, uh, who is an RN and also a NACA co-founder. So we pin you guys, take off my camera, and take it away. Thank you very much, Matt, and glad to be here with you today, Lisa. Thank you for including me. Um, caring for your residents and yourself is a topic that both of us are very, very passionate about. So I welcome you uh, to NACA's first of a series called The Care You Give, The Care You Get. It will be an exclusive cutting edge webinar series on topics designed to inform and empower CNAs and help them live their very best life on and off the job. This first one is open to everyone, but as Matt said, the rest of the series will be free for NACA members. So if you're not a member, join today. Membership is less than 10 cents per day and much less, ex less expensive than a webinar. So these are for you and about you. And uh, as Matt said, they're kind of a two-in-one webinar. So let's get started. I'd like to talk if we could go to the next, the part one, CNA self-care. Self-care is, has never been more important than it is today. We might go ahead and switch, go to the next slide, if you would, please. It's never been more important for CNAs to care for themselves and for all caregivers working out in the field today. This CNA shortage, no one feels it more than the residents and you. And the COVID resurgence has got to be taking a massive toll on each and every one of you. I heard someone put it today, it's like being on a long car ride that just doesn't end. You have no idea when it's going to be over. And just when we thought, we were making progress. Here we have found resurgence. The vaccine mandate has been one of the most stressful issues I believe we've dealt with here at NACA. So I know it is such an important matter. No matter what your stance is on that, you are impacted by the vaccine mandate. Moral distress, I can only imagine, is at the highest, highest level it's ever been for CNAs and others out there caring. Moral distress is when you are working with less than what you need. Early on, PPE, the shortage, being unprotected, created moral distress. Trying to decide which resident you care for next creates moral distress. I received a message from a member a few nights ago who was very saddened because she knew she was having a resident that was going to pass, but she's always been able to be there for her residents for their last breath, to, to comfort them and help ease any pain or fear they're having. And she, but she had over 30 residents that evening. 
And when she went back to check on this particular resident, she had died. Talk about moral distress when you do everything you can do. And it is nowhere close to enough. On part two today, we're going to talk about frailty of residents. But their becoming more frail has impacted you in ways that no one can really measure. And just the responsibilities, the school issue, the children, the, the trying to deal with all the overtime and the constant, constant barrage of requests to work over, do overtime, work a second shift, pick up another day. And the distress of that and that responsibility is incredible. And I don't really think that even I nor Lisa can fully grasp everything you all have stressed over this last year and a half. And we know that you went into this. Most of the things outside of COVID that are impacting us today were already a very distressing situation. Staffing has been terrible for years and has exploded under COVID and with the vaccine mandate and so many CNAs and nurses saying they will leave the nursing home space. What a tragedy for us all. I have always, we here at NACA, this team, and I have always been able to unite CNAs in our profession. We want the same things. We need the same things. You deserve those things. And we fought hard to help your voice be heard. And then we have to. We have to keep doing it because we have to make people aware. You deserve for people to know exactly what you've been through. But what we also must realize is you have to find ways to care for yourself. And, you know, next slide, please. To those of you in the midst of all of this storm, I want to say thank you. Lisa reminded me that of the saying that I quote often, I don't know who's responsible for originally saying it, but some say we're all in the same boat here. I'll never believe that's true. We're all in this same storm but everyone has different boats. Every one of us, every person. We have our own situation and our own stresses to deal with. So put your stress and frustration to work. Let me uh, talk for just a moment about how I know all this stuff is easier said than done and there can't be anybody more non-compliant about taking care of their self than I have been over the years. Now, you know, 20, January 2020, I had a, a pretty significant heart attack. Um, and, you know, it was important that I, you know, it was a wake up call. So I did do some of the things that I needed to do, but have I done everything? No, because I'm non-compliant. I don't, you, we can all make up every excuse in the world. But I want to tell you personally, before I get into some of the things and where you can focus stress and frustration is the best advice I can give you in self-care. And I am no expert, but it is to, it is something I was never accustomed to, but I tried it and it works for me and it's called solitude. Even in your car, there are places you can go and have a few minutes of solitude. You know, sometimes that's why people smoke, so they can have some solitude. 15, however long it, I forget. One of those things I did after my heart attack is I quit smoking cigarettes. And, you know, that's never easy for anyone. And it wasn't necessarily the health scare because, you know, I make choices I chose to smoke for years and that will have consequences. But I realized why do any more damage? That was something I could do, so I did it. 
Now, a lot of people will say when you're stressed out, it's no time to quit smoking. So I'm not lecturing you to quit. I'm just sharing with you some of the things I did. I force myself when I, you know, when I, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of willpower for exercise. I love sports, but there's nothing that bores me more than a gym with workout stuff. I've had every exercise equipment throughout the years in this house, and I don't find exercise rewarding and fun. Now, someone told me if I would do it for a solid three weeks that it would get in my blood and I wouldn't be able to stop doing it. Well, did I prove them wrong? I rode my exercise bike for three weeks, five miles every day, and it never got in my blood. But what I could also do was eat better. Pick things that are full of protein and going to fill you up and carry you. We can't heal without protein. So try to watch what you eat. Try to stay hydrated and take some time for you. Even five minutes where there's no noise will help charge a stressed battery. And I'm not saying these things to make light of it. Here's what we can do with our frustration that comes out of stress, such as, you know, advocacy for our for yourselves, for our profession and for the residents. We have opportunities here at NACA for your voice to be heard, and I wish a whole lot more of you would take action and spread the word. Here's something positive we can talk about. If CNAs can get on the same page with pay, with how many CNAs it takes to care for our residents and not just minimal care. What do our residents deserve? And then say, what's a responsible amount of CNAs? Use your, your dedication as inspiration to others to become CNAs. Really, you might be saying, who would do this? You're doing it. You're doing it because it's worthwhile. You're doing it because it's in your blood. It's who we are. And that's why this mandate is so gut-wrenching because many CNAs who are against it are some of the absolute best CNAs in the United States of America. Stress, stress, stress. But share your stories. They are inspirational to others. We've had many CNAs write their stories and be published in local papers. Our blogs that are on our website, I'll show you some examples of these things in just, uh, just a few moments. Social media, we can let our voices be heard there and actually create solutions. And then use your NACA membership, anything and everything to educate yourself advocate for yourself and your colleagues and most importantly your residents the residents stories will never be told unless you tell them you are uniquely positioned to tell your stories as well as your residents and patients across this country i've never seen a time when you're more stressed or more divided as a profession so we need to work to create a better culture for CNAs. You can do this in your own workplace. There's more CNAs, even in this shortage, there's more CNAs than any other employee group. You have the best chance of changing the culture, at least for you and your fellow CNAs and your residents. Take action. Doing something positive combats stress and frustration. And although we can, you can give in, and Lord God knows you've had to have collapsed at certain points throughout the last year and a half, and no doubt throughout your career. One reason you've handled COVID as well as you have is because you have been conditioned for this stressful process profession for many years. 
So make a decision to do something positive, and one of the most positive things you could do right now for you and your profession is to work together, whether you agree or not, don't agree, on vaccine or other areas. One thing that every CNA should be able to agree on is that creating a better culture at work will be better for you and better for the other CNAs and, excuse me, I have a little fly in here, and better for the residents. So why make it better? Because you're making it better for you too. And that creating change and improvements, even in the face of adversity, brings stress relief. Next slide. Here's a, 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 an example of our CNA Advocacy Center. We're working very hard right now to get CNA wages increased through a Medicaid pass-through. And we need our members and those visitors of NACA and non-member CNAs who may be seeing this today on Facebook. We stand to serve you and we have for the last 26 years. Would you be willing to become a member if you're not already? The investment in this is less than 10 cents a day to help us increase CNA pay. Less than 10 cents a day. And we are working hard. In just a few minutes, I'll, I'll have another announcement that I'll make before I close out my portion of the webinar, which is now, uh, I've been going 20 minutes, so I need to get on the ball here. Next slide is a um, example of our blogs on the website. Sherry Perry, a CNA who also is the board of directors at NACA, her blog has, the last I heard was early last week and it had already been viewed over 3,000 times then and not by other CNAs necessarily. It has been shared throughout the nation in various networks and channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, websites. It's been shared and shared. Don't tell me people don't care. We have to share so that they can continue to care and support us. Next slide. Have hope that change is on the horizon. And I know you might think that where in the world is she coming up with these slogans? Have hope that changes. You haven't seen much change for the better in all of our careers. But I have to tell you through NACA, over the last year and a half, we have been the go-to place if someone wants to know about CNAs, what you feel, what you think, what you know, most of my time, as the team can tell you, has been spent with reporters, with researchers, academics, uh, think tanks, policy, uh, health policy people, and a lot of roundtables that is reframing, reimagining nursing homes. CNAs are normally never represented at these kind of of work groups and committees across the country. Your voice is being heard through our work, but we need you to support us too. NICE, some of you have heard about NICE. NACA has worked diligently for the last year. I was reminded by Matt earlier in the week that NICE, we just started on this, not even really one year ago. It hasn't been a full year in developing the National Institute of CNA Excellence, a professional home for CNAs. And you talk about self-care. We're working with Tammy Marshall over at Biophilia to have an entire series on self-care because again, it's never been more important than it is today. So I want, it will be available at NICE, the self-care education as well as NACA. And we're very excited to have someone of Tammy's um, depth and knowledge and expertise join us as adjunct faculty at NICE to cover self-care. The one thing I said I would wait on to tell you about just happened today. And it is that uh, we will have a statement or a press release on it in the coming days, but I have been asked, invited, as one of nine people in the U.S. 
to be interviewed on nursing homes staffing levels, CNA staffing levels. Now, I didn't get there because of me. I didn't get the invite because of me. We received the invite because of you. We are your voice. We've become your voice. And we want to serve you to the absolute best of our ability. So it's a federal sector consulting firm that has reached out on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services regarding the disturbing nursing home staffing levels during COVID. How exciting. I'm, I sound serious about it, but it's because it is serious. People are listening to us. So let's keep on keeping on. Take the best care you can of yourself. Five minute break. Buy yourself somewhere. Whatever it takes to get some quiet and some peace and some deep breaths. Take a minute for you. And now um, we're going to transition. Uh, you can, I think Matt mentioned, post questions and things of that nature for us. But I'm going to set up the transition now for part two of our, our, our webinar, The Care You Give, The Care, the care You Get, The Care You Give, uh, to my cohort, as we're often referred to, Lisa Sweet, who is going to talk to us about frailty in elders. Lisa? I remembered to unmute myself. Yay! I'm learning. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Sweet. I'm a registered nurse and co-founder of the National Association of Healthcare Assistants. And you may recognize me from my CNA TV segment, CNA Heroes. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. It's about people just like yourself who... Um, I recognize as outstanding CNAs. But enough about that. We're going to talk a little bit about recognizing frailty in elders. Um, <clears throat> this is very important for anybody who's working in long-term care or with elders, and especially important for CNAs to know about. Next slide, please, Matt. And by the way, Matthew, when the guest speaker is ready, you can go ahead and make that announcement. So, okay, so we're talking about frailty and we do have a guest speaker who is much more of an expert in frailty than I am, who's gonna have some great, great guidance for you in recognizing frailty. And um, she is a nurse practitioner and she will be joining us in a little bit. But, um, so first, let's talk a little bit about what's frailty. We hear about the frail and elderly, the frail and elderly, and all of the news releases that go that go out from all of the different long-term care organizations, they always refer to the resident population as the frail and elderly. So frail and frailty is a very commonly used word, but we often don't realize what exactly... Um, Frailty means frailty occurs with aging as a result of all of the age related changes that occurs to our body. You know, we can all, as we age, we see the wrinkles and the gray hair, but changes occur within our bodies, within our organs and our body systems with aging. And that really impacts frailty. So frailty occurs with aging as a, as a result of the body's difficulty fighting off or bouncing back from illness or injury. So frailty refers to um, the body's difficulty fighting off or bouncing back from illness or injury. Um, and so uh, one really important thing to remember about frailty is that you can't necessarily look at a person and determine if that person is frail or has frailty. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. So how frail a person is depends on a number of factors. 
Uh, it depends on things like the ability to perform activities of daily living, like bathing or dressing. And you all have seen it. You work with the resident who's able to really participate in their care for uh, a certain amount of time. And then you start seeing a decline. They're, they're no longer able to participate as much in that care. Uh, the presence of common geriatric conditions or chronic conditions such as dementia or incontinence impacts frailty. Polypharmacy, which simply means taking several prescriptions, can have an impact on a person's level of frailty. And I believe that the last I read was that the average nursing home resident is on six prescriptions. And so probably the majority of the residents do have polypharmacy going on. And then a person's weight, an elder's weight and nutritional status can impact their frailty level to great degree because so much is, so much of a person's health is, is based on weight and nutritional status. And you all have seen it. You're in the residence rooms and you're sweating and, and putting on Ted hose and, and changing the bed and it's hot and the residents sitting there and they say they're freezing and they want the heat on. Well, that's because their body weight is probably below uh, what um, the average is and they have no body fat. So they don't hold in their body heat, they lose it. And so that makes them feel cold all the time. So weight and nutritional status have a great deal to do with frailty. Next slide, please. So you're probably sitting there watching this, thinking that Lori was much more inspiring or entertaining because so often people think the clinical topics are rather dry or boring. But I am persistent in presenting clinical topics because you all as CNAs are so instrumental in every aspect of quality care. You're so instrumental in prevention of urinary tract infections and pressure ulcers, and, and you're instrumental sometimes in making the resident smile, which sounds like a little thing, but in these times, that's huge. And so um, I'm just really determined to give CNAs all of the clinical information that I possibly can, because I want you to have as much knowledge as possible. And some people say, well, I'm gonna know more than the nurses. Hey, that's okay. You are gonna be able to provide the best quality of care possible. So why is knowing how frail a resident is important? Why do we need to know how frail the residents are? Can't we just assume that they're all frail? Well, <clears throat> there's, there's some, obvious benefits to knowing exactly how frail on a scale is or, or how to have a quantitative number for how frail a resident is. And so understanding the first, the first big thing in my opinion is that understanding the fact that what someone looks like doesn't tell the full story can help you provide the best possible, most person-centered care for your residents. Now that just sounds like a jumble of words, but what I'm saying is when you understand that you can't judge a book by its cover, so to speak, that is, that is going to allow you to provide the best, most person-centered care possible. So, you are understanding that, uh, that what the resident is looking like doesn't tell the full story. Let me give you an example. I recently bought a bouquet of flowers at Walmart, brought them home, fixed them in a vase, and I was just amazed the other day that the flowers were actually still alive and looked pretty good, and it had been 10 days. And I'm like, wow, these are like zombie flowers. And the flowers looked good and the, the petals had good color. But then I went to scoot the vase on the table and just that movement of scooting the vase 
made all the petals fall off of the flowers and onto the table. So I had a the flowers looked almost as good as the day I bought them, but all the petals fell off. Testing and, and working on this frailty program, it reminded me of that, that you can't tell how frail someone is by looking at them. Just that I couldn't tell what condition those flowers are in by looking at them. I thought they were in great shape. I moved the vase, all the petals fall off. And so that's, that's um, just a little analogy to frailty and elders. We may think that somebody looks like they're really healthy and could just about run a marathon. And then they come down with an illness or an injury that they just never can bounce back from and regain that functioning. And so that is frailty. So another important um, reason to know how frail your residents are is because knowing which residents have higher levels of frailty can really help determine what signs and symptoms, what red flags you need to be watching for. When I was a nursing director, oh my gosh, I counted on the nursing assistants, the CNA, so much to let me know when there were changes in the condition or changes in baseline of the resident. And I have to admit it, the nurses hated it because it was a small building and, well, 58 beds, I believe. And I would have CNAs. I had an open door. I had CNAs pop their head in and say, hey, you know, Mrs. Chastain down on West Hall, she's not looking too good today. So I would know that I needed to check on Mrs. Chastain myself and check on the nurses to make certain that she was getting follow-up and treatment. So I know how important it is to have CNAs who know when a person is off of their baseline. And you all know their baseline. Why? Because you work with them every day. You spend the most time with them. So when there is a red flag, you recognize it. Knowing a person's frailty level is going to help you know what red flags to look for and what you should expect and what you need to report immediately. Um, you can watch for and support signs of increasing frailty. And this can really help the nursing team identify services or care that can help slow a resident's decline. For example, for someone who still has a relatively low frailty level, or let's say that they are one of the least frail people on your hall, possibly some strength training could help that person stay healthier longer. And so knowing that person's frailty level can help you recommend and provide care and services that really helps the resident maintain their health. And isn't that what a lot of our job is about? Um, and then knowing a person's frailty level really gives everyone, including the family members, a realistic outlook for how the resident will recover or most likely will recover from illness or injury. And so what this simply means is that Everybody, including the family, no, kind of knows what to expect. There aren't any surprises. Um, you don't have family members who are in shock when grandma or grandpa takes a quick decline and doesn't bounce back because they have a high frailty level. And so it just really sets up for realistic um, expectations all around the board among everybody. <clears throat> and so um, it's very important. Next slide map. So while all older adults have some level of frailty, some are much more frail than others. And again, you cannot assess frailty or measure frailty based on a person's looks or appearance because like I said sometimes a person can look like they are extremely healthy and in reality they could be one of the most vulnerable residents that you have and so that is something very important to remember 
Um, Matt, has our guest speaker checked in yet? No, uh, not yet. I think we're still, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, four minutes. Oh, so. oh okay, about four minutes ahead of schedule. And so, um, Lori, if you want to turn your mic on. I think this is a good time as well to mention that um, this is going to be a recurring series, right? Maybe not necessarily the care you give, care you get every single month, but one of the things that we wanted to do is make sure that our members had uh, benefits attached to their membership. And so this current uh, webinar is free to everybody, right? Anybody's able to watch it. But um, going forward, some of these monthly webinars, not all of them, but some of these monthly webinars that we're going to be doing, we are going to be making members only because uh, we want to support those who have supported us. And so um, going forward after this month, uh, you'll see promotions for webinars, if you're a member, um, that, that uh, kind of go along the same vein, and you'll be able to participate in them, whereas someone who is not a member will not be. And uh, again, to encourage you, if you are a member, you have access to our members-only section of the website. Um, which has all of these videos and webinars that we've done archived in there. So if, you, if you're working one day or something like that, you can go back and catch the ones that you missed um, on there and have access to them at any time. Maybe you're a, a third shift person and you're not able to attend during the day because you're sleeping. Well, just, just jump on that membership portal and you can uh, tune into any of the webinars that you missed. So that's, that's all I really wanted to add there. Thanks, guys. No, that's uh, all good to know. And Lisa, uh, as always, I learned a few things from you uh, on frailty today. So uh, you may say that clinical is not everybody's bag, but Rowena said she loves t clinical knowledge and education. And I, uh, I know Thank you, Rowena. I know Sheena and a whole lot of other um, CNAs are pretty passionate about being able to provide the best clinical care they can within their scope of responsibility. So thank yeah. you for that. And I think your guest has arrived. And so we're thankful to have Jessica Griffiths with us. So Lisa, yeah. why don't you go ahead and uh, make Hi, that Jessica, segue. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> We've already been talking a little bit about frailty and why it's so important for CNAs to understand it. Um, but one of the things we really haven't discussed is how is frailty determined or how is it quantified or and thank you so much for being here and tell us a little bit about yourself yeah i'm happy to be here um so as you know my name is jessica griffiths i um actually started my journey and career in healthcare as a cna while i was working for my bachelor's degree i worked in um in the main part of an assisted living facility to start and then transition to um, the locked memory care unit. So I have experience in both types of facilities. Um, I did that for about five years before I became an RN. And since I've become an RN, I've kind of worked my way through a couple different specialties. Um, med surge, I worked as an oncology nurse and as a correctional nurse and have had different experiences, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, with frailty in each of those roles. I am currently um, working as a case manager for a rural hospital in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. And I also work as the um, clinical product manager for Patient Pattern, which is a company that um, uses frailty to drive care planning for nurse practitioners and different long-term care providers of geriatric populations. So I've, I've developed a short presentation on frailty specifically for the CNA from Patient Pattern. And as you've already been introduced, um, frailty is really an assessment um, and quality of the normal aging process. And the best way that I have come to understand frailty um, is really how likely a elderly patient is to recover back to their baseline functioning 
from a major insult to their health, be that a um, very invasive surgery or a extreme illness like COVID-19, something that really attacks the entire body and health system and, and puts that patient in a vulnerable health situation. So you can think of frailty as a gas tank and the more fit and vital you are, the more full your tank is. And as that frailty increases, you're burning more gas to try and fight off insult to your body. Your tank becomes empty. You become more frail. And frailty typically ranges from not frail at all, fit and vital, to mild frailty, moderate frailty, severely frail, or um, vulnerable and end of life type of situations. And so for nursing assistants and CNAs, frailty is important because it really puts your patients at risk for bad outcomes. And a lot of times the CNAs are the patient or the, the staff members and caregivers who are working with patients the most often and they know the most about the patients. They're the hands, eyes, ears. There, there are tools as advanced care providers to really know what that patient is like and what's a change for our patients. Um, so... As frailty increases, as the gas tank starts to run low, it significantly increases um, the risk of decline. And we really rely on nursing assistants in the world of frailty to identify what those subtle, subtle changes are going to be as a patient becomes more frail and their health status may deteriorate. CNAs in particular have a huge impact on a lot of different um, factors that affect frailty. And on the slide, you can see some of the major that affect frailty include mood, activities of daily living, falls in mobility, nutrition, incontinence status, environmental safety, and then communication and use of the five senses. This is something that as a CNA, I was involved with every single day. You, you guys are the ones who are helping your patients stay safe and free from falls or pressure injuries. You're the ones who are feeding these patients and providing hygiene to these patients and really, you know, preventing frailty um, that could develop from any one of these categories if it were to start to decline. So a good example is incontinence. And in your incontinent patients, early intervention with um, an incontinent episode prevents bed sores and skin breakdown. And it also can severely affect a patient's mood, behavior, and attitude of whether they're sitting in a soiled brief and um, have some skin irritation or know they're soiled. And so their mood is affected by it in addition to the dermatologic and infectious risks that are posed by being exposed to the urine and feces that they may be sitting in. So that's just one example of how the CNA immediately can improve somebody's frailty and risk of becoming more frail. And I have a little um, example to give you guys. This is kind of more of an at-home environment, but it was the best picture that I could find that, that really incorporated a lot of different aspects of frailty. And so this is something that you can look at in residence rooms or in common areas, anywhere where your patients are um, inhabiting. And, and some of the things that when I look at this picture, I notice would be a concern for frailty is obviously there's tripping hazards all over this room, right? And there's rugs thrown about, there's cords going across the walkways. Clearly, this patient is going to be at risk for fall. I would be at risk for falls in this room. Another um, concern that I notice in this picture is in the bottom right corner, you can see that her glasses are on the table. And it looks like she might be wearing some glasses as well, but maybe the person coming down the stairs, those are her glasses. So that's a concern of, you know, are, are there... Um, devices that they need to see and hear within arm's reach so that they communicate effectively. And, and that can contribute greatly to frailty of, oh, uh, grandma lost her glasses and she can't see anything without them. Um, 
a little further into this, you can see that medicine cabinet is in complete disarray, probably intervention, but certainly something that you guys may notice is if there's pills in the room that are unidentified and unlabeled or, um, you know, not organized, that puts a patient at huge risk for a medication reaction or, or interaction and and any, the more medications that a patient takes, the higher their frailty level is because they're at higher risk for those interacting with each other. Um, cigarette smoking and alcohol use, chronic use of either one of those products will definitely increase your frailty. Stairs, um, especially for our less mobile patients, can be a huge hazard. And then the other piece that I really like to point out that would potentially be a positive um, factor of frailty in this picture is the cat. And in my mind, as a, as a pet lover, <laughs> all kind of pet lover, that would improve my frailty. And so you want to think of those things of, okay, she's clearly enjoying her television show. She has her kitty right there with her. What are things that I could improve my, or do to improve my resident's moods? and really bring some quality of life to their daily living. And, and in my mind, you know, it would be the cat for this person. So different creative ways and activities that you can get your patients involved with will definitely improve their quality of life and thus improve their frailty. Really, when you approach frailty, um, you wanna think of it as a team approach. And so, this is going to be something that has to be attacked from all angles, the CNA, physical therapy, nursing, physicians, pharmacy. Um, it, it really cannot, frailty cannot improve without one of those missing pieces. And like I said, you guys are, are the hands on deck and the, and the people who know those patients the best. So you're really a crucial element to managing the risks associated with decline in function and increased frailty. And if you have interest in um, a more in-depth uh, discussion about frailty, we do have a frailty certification at Patient Pattern that I am happy to provide for you guys. I, I know some time constraints existed to where going more into this curriculum was not appropriate for this presentation. But I, if at any point um, you'd like more information about uh continued nursing education or um, some continuing education credits, we do have this frailty certification that does provide continuing education credits that I can provide for you. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. Yes. Yes, we yeah. would definitely like more information on that. Yeah, I, I can um, certainly get that for you guys. Uh, Margaret is the coordinator of that for our company. So I will let her know that that would be an interest and anybody who has interest in getting signed up for that, it's a, it's a pretty easy process. So we can, we can get anybody who wants to set up with that. Um, well, going well, very, very good. You know, we're always looking for opportunities for CNAs to expand their knowledge base. And that's, that's just fantastic. I, I learned a lot during your presentation. Um, Matt, have we had any questions or anything? Yeah, like that? yeah, we 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 do have uh, a couple questions, um, mm -hmm. and I'd encourage anybody um, who's on Zoom or Facebook Live to go ahead and put those questions in the chat, and our team will get those and and ask them on here. But our first question comes from uh, Corinne Ganchinitz, and it says, uh, "Do you feel loneliness?" could cause frailty as well during COVID. Families were unable to see loved ones, not having human touch or seeing a smile. Would that affect frailty? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great question, Corinne. So COVID has presented a whole new world of challenges related to frailty um, being one of the major impacts that could affect a patient's quality of life and frailty level itself. Loneliness specifically speaks to the concept of mood and behavior um, and, and the impacts of mood on frailty. And the way I would best approach loneliness and your approach to how it will, in, or your thoughts on how it will affect frailty is when you're lonely and at home and depressed because you haven't seen your family members, you're less motivated to engage in healthy back activities. You would, it, when you're lonely and sad, you want to binge on Netflix and pizza. 
You don't want to get up and go socialize and eat healthy foods. And that has a huge impact on quality of life and overall health status. So absolutely, loneliness plays a huge role in frailty. Wow. Great. Thank you. I actually have a question. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit um, timely. Um, Probably by now, everybody has heard about the very unfortunate circumstances in Louisiana with the residents in the warehouse. Um, and I believe so far, seven residents um, have succumbed to, I guess, the whole move and everything. I mean, in your, I mean, in your opinion, is is that kind of an example? The frailer residents couldn't with. And I mean, there, it was grueling conditions that they were in, but the frailest of the residents were probably the ones who perished. And that. Yeah, so frailty is really affected by any potential insult to your bodily health. Um, so it could be a major fall with an injury. It could be um, what I alluded to earlier of the environmental safety. And do they, even if they perceive that they are unsafe in their living environment, whether they are or not, that'll right. be a huge impact on how they recover from any insults. Um, so the hurricane alone more than likely made the much more frail than they would have been prior to the hurricane. And I'm sure many of them had lived through previous environmental <laughs> exposures and, and with other hurricanes in the past had some anxiety related to this hurricane that predisposed them to a higher frailty level um, that, you know, with all of the factors and, and really it's, you want to think of frailty kind of like a Jenga block tower. And so your Jenga block tower is your perfect, healthy, 100% individual who has no problems at all, no deficits, nothing's wrong with them. Obviously, that doesn't happen to all of us. So you start taking out pieces for every piece that adds to your frailty of, okay, this patient is really anxious from a past experience with a hurricane. One of those blocks comes out. Now they have diabetes and require medications that aren't going to be available to them after a hurricane hits. Another couple blocks come out. Now they're not going to have clean drinking water and not going to be able to eat the healthy foods that they need to manage their diabetes. Okay, another couple blocks come out. Eventually, frailty with all of the accumulation of those deficits leads to the tower toppling over because so many deficits are too much for one individual to handle. Wow, that's a great visual, a great way of explaining it. And actually a great segue into our next uh, question. If you don't mind, I'm going to stop your sharing so we can put your faces up big oh, and yeah. see all of you at once. Uh, don't worry, I took care of it. So using your, your Jenga tower analogy there, um, we've been talking a lot about, you know, how people become more frail. Is, is there ever a reverse? Can, can you, you know, increase... Well, I don't know exactly how to put it, but can you reduce people's frailty um, and build ba back their Jenga tower? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of different approaches to frailty, and all of them are equally researched. Um, the concept and approach that I favor is an accumulation of deficits um, that contributes to frailty. And so accumulation of deficits is each of these individual problems added together creates their frailty level. Um, so an easy example that wouldn't necessarily apply to a CNA practice, but could be something that CNAs are aware of is polypharmacy and multiple medications that a patient is taking. And if you know that a patient is taking a bunch of medications, some of those medications may not be appropriate for the patient and are easily taken away. Um, a good CNA example is, is mood and what we talked about with loneliness, especially in the world of COVID. And if you notice that your patients and your residents are, are just not themselves, they weren't who they were a couple of years ago. They used to come and play cards every Tuesday night with their friends and they were very sociable and happy and they just haven't been that happy bubbly person anymore. 
set up a FaceTime with their family members and, and do something to get them engaged with some social activity and, and really improve their loneliness. And as their quality of life improves related to their loneliness, put that Jenga block back in there because then you've resolved that deficit and you've subtracted that deficit from the total sum of deficits that that patient is suffering from. Some of them are a little harder to address, um, especially with the patients that you guys are likely working with. Mobility status is one that, you know, some patients are just are not going to be back to their baseline walking capabilities ever again. But, you know, instead of focusing on that, oh, you may not ever be able to walk without your walker again. Well, let's go outside with your walker. Let's take a walk around the block and see what you can do. And let's maintain the function that you have rather than letting you sit in your chair and be disappointed that you're not where you were 30 years ago. Let's focus on on what what we can maintain and what we can sustain related to your mobility status. And so that would be one of the pieces of, okay, that Jenga block slid halfway out, but we're not going to let it come all the way out. So there's certain levels of maintaining frailty level and not letting it decline any further. And at the same time, um, contributing to improving frailty and putting those blocks back in. Thank you so much for that. That, that was actually a question for me. So um, I, I really appreciate your answer on that. That's fantastic presentation. Well, yeah. And, and thank you so much for joining us, uh, Jessica. I really appreciate it. I know all the audience does as well. And that actually wraps up our hour. It kind of flew by. Yes, um, indeed. But, I, you know, I, again, I just want, before I, I give you all a, a, a chance to do a closing, um, I, again, I just want to encourage anybody who's watched this, to, um, you know, to continue to support NACA and to engage with us on, on what we do. Your voice is so important and your engagement and involvement in, in things like this, things like we're doing today. This isn't Absolutely. forced upon you. This isn't an in-service that you have to attend. It's not mandatory. <laughs> that's where I was going. This isn't a mandatory in-service uh, in where we're holding your paychecks hostage. You guys choose to be here. And that says something about you as professionals and your willingness to grow both personally and professionally. So hats off to you guys out there who, who are, who are watching this um, either recorded or live or on zoom or Facebook or whatever. And just, just know that if you want to continue to participate in these, we're, we're going to continue to have some free webinars, but we want to make sure that we're really driving as much content as we can to our members and those who are actively engaging with us. I just encourage you to, to look on our website. It'll be posted in the chat. Um, just www.nakacna.org. And uh, that, that's my pitch. I'm sorry. I had to do it. Um, and I'll, I'll now, just I'll you, give I have you a all. Question. Sure. Um, the information on certification on the frailty course, where will we post that so that people will know where to go for that? That's a really great question. I think what we can do is if Jessica has a link and things like that, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak for her, but we could obviously promote that on our Facebook page. Okay. Um, it, I'm seeing a nod. So th that, that sounds like something that we can do. And then also anybody who registered for this webinar, we can send out an email blast to them on that. And then if you think about it, we have the uh, frailty blog on our website as well. And so again, if Jessica and patient pattern wanted to, we could add that information at the bottom of that blog so it'll it'll live there as well as on facebook and and in the emails that sounds Again, great. I, I don't want to speak out of turn I, there but. i think it's great and we're well over time but jessica thank you so much for spending some time with us and uh, i hope this isn't the last time we have an opportunity to work together so we're very enlightened and i love the respect and and uh that you pay to cnas and I'm very impressed there's a certification on frailty. So we will learn more about that and uh, let our members in on that as well. So thank you all, Matt, thank thanks you. for moderating. And let's go ahead and draw this one to a close. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us and you all have a great day. Thank you again, Jessica thank and you. Patient Pattern for participating. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye.